Right now, I'm going to tell you, this is the moment that many of you have prayed for for come decades. On, come on, come on. Colorado Springs does not belong to the devil. It belongs to Jesus. Come on, somebody help me. It belongs to Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you that the secret weapon is all these young people down here. But I'm going to... <laughs> but I'm going to add one point. Every time you worship the Lord, you get younger. Your, your joints get stronger. You get flexible. Your regular sleep pattern will come back. Now... How many of you want to help me to obey God tonight? Raise your hand. I need to get all of this army back in your seats and remain standing until they are back in their seats. And if you've been saving a seat for someone, because we've got people waiting to get in, we may need you to move in tight and uh, we just can't save seats anymore. We have a revival problem. We're in a revival. We have all the revival problems. The uh, local businesses that you parked in may be towing your car away. We don't want that to happen to you. So you may need to go and take care of that. But uh, somebody save their seats. Make sure if anybody has to leave, they can get back and uh, our workers every last seat that we own let's make it available right now now before you're seated everyone look at me how many of you believe in this room that America is going to come back to God how many of you believe that all right I'm going to say some things that many of you are not ready for. And I pray you will get ready because I need you to be ready to open your heart for the truth. Ground rule number one. Many of you in this room will undergo a mystical, inexplicable transformation in your heart. A force, look at me, a force is going to go to work on you. And that's going to change your mind, your direction, and your priority. And I'm going to open the Word of God, speak to you from that Word. And the invisible person of the Holy Spirit is going to drive truth into your heart. You need not fear because what's going to happen to you is the best thing that ever could happen to you. And be careful not to reject the word because rejecting what I'm about to tell you is the worst thing you could ever do. Not just for yourself, but for those that you love. I did not come to Colorado Springs to win a popularity contest. I am under strict orders to give specific words from the Bible so that the result will be the working power of God. 
So we're going to begin. We're going to get into that word right now. So wherever you are, I'd like you to be seated. And I want to welcome you. And how many of you can give one more shout to the Lord for this amazing, amazing, amazing. We want to welcome thousands of people that are watching by live stream right now. They're watching on several platforms, and there's no telling who may be watching. But I'm going to welcome you, and I'm going to tell you that the same rules that apply to this audience apply to you. You may not come forward in this tent, but I'm going to have you do it in your hotel room, in your bedroom, in your dining room, in your classroom, or you may be watching in a bar. I love it when it's like that. I don't know how many bar parties I have ruined in my ministry <laughs> since I discovered live stream. But it's been a blessing. A few seances too, by the way. So I want to welcome all of you that are watching, and I want you to be prepared not only to be saved, but to be healed. And you will feel the power of God. It will come right through your device, and you will feel it. There is a beautiful countenance on many of your faces. It is my favorite look in the whole world. It is a world, it is a continent, countenance of consternation, a little bit of nervousness, kind of edginess. It is what I call the, I was kidnapped and dragged here by my friend look. And you are repeating gently under your breath, I will not join a cult. I will not join a cult. I'm not going to sell flowers at the airport. <laughs> the problem is not just that we who love the Lord are normal. We are beyond normal. And this is beyond real. And it's beyond true. It's truer than true and more real than real. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to everyone who believes and to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. We begin by reading from the book a story. And I'm going to tell you a story very quickly and why it's important. When I was in college, back in the year 19, none of your business, <laughs> I had been saved in San Francisco, and I went to Reading to go to college at a small community college there. And I was 200 miles away from Mexican food. I had to exist on food and water. And my mother, who is in heaven, raised eight children in the inner city. Amazing. She could make a chili relleno that would give you a vision of God. <laughs> Look, her sauces were indescribable. Later on, when I got in the ministry, we had rock stars that would ask if my mom would cook for them. That's what her food was like. But I'm up there at college starving on regular food. <laughs> one day, one of my friends in the local accent said to me, we have a new restaurant here that serves ethnic food. <laughs> and I said, what kind? And he said, Mexican. And I knelt on one knee and began to thank God for my rescue. We recently were delivered from affirmative action. And uh, yeah, 
But back in that day, back in that day, it was everywhere. And I went to the ethnic restaurant that they had described, and I saw the sign. It said Taco Bell. <laughs> and the boomers will understand what I'm about to say. That what I'm going to love is the bewildered look on the young faces. I looked at that. I didn't think it was a restaurant. I thought that we Latinos finally had our own telephone company. <laughs> now, I put the alleged taco in my mouth. And you need to know the physiological change that I went through. And only those of my background will be able to explain it. My tongue jumped to the roof of my mouth and ran to the back and cut off my air supply. <laughs> and I could hear my tongue threatening me, saying, you either spit this out or I'll choke you to death. How the others could eat it, I did not know. But, and here's where we get to it. I had tears in my eyes, not for my sake, but for their sake. I looked at him and I said the saddest thing I could think of. You believe this is Mexican food. You have no idea. You are not just culturally deprived, you are culinary refugees. I just made that up, that's an interesting phrase, by the way. <laughs> culinary refugee. Evidently, that's someone who's running from food. Now, the moment that I've been waiting for has come. Many of you in this room think you know what Christianity tastes like. I'm not getting, a, I'm, I'm waiting. No. You have no idea how far from religion knowing Jesus really is. I need some help with that. You have no idea how far from it. I want to read some verses without interruption. You, you hardly ever see this done. It's very rare. Watch, it'll be on the screen. Luke 14, starting at verse 16. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground, I must go and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and told the master those things that the, and then the master of the house being angry. I repeat, the master of the house being angry said to his servants, go out quietly, quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in those in here, the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you've commanded and there is still room. Then the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you, 
that none of those who were invited should taste my supper. I've got to ask you a question. What glory did Christ see before he took the form of man? What was it like to be at the right hand of God from before time? What glory did he see? This is why I believe it was more of an insult than a temptation when the devil offered Christ the kingdoms of the world. For the glory that Christ knew. But you have a dilemma. You have a crisis. You that are seated under this tent have a problem. Because the Bible says that he called it a great feast. And what kind of a feast is it that Christ said it was great? And the important thing here in this message is that he's using this as a parable of the Christian faith. The one that the experts love to malign. The ones that get on the media and accuse it of being racist and materialistic and fantasy and fairy tales. What they call a lie, Jesus called a great feast. What they call powerless, Christ called a great feast. What is it about the Christian faith that someone who dwelled in heaven came to earth and said a man gave a great feast and invited many? Many of you have invited your neighbors to come. And it looks like a lot of people were successful. But we know that many in this city would have a stereotype of this tent and of me and of you. Oh, that, that's just all fraud. That's a money-grabbing preacher. That's just another fake. But ladies and gentlemen, you can believe that all you want. You don't have the right to decide what is true and what is false. You're, look, you're entitled to an opinion, but you're not entitled to decide what is truth. Now the Bible says that when these people said no, and you've said no to God, and you know the professors at your university have said no to God. Is that something that I should get angry about? You better believe it. I'm standing here right now. I'm going to tell you, I wish those professors would talk to me. You bullies. You know, I'm not one of your adoring students who needs a grade. You can say all that stuff and use all that information, but I know you're lying through your teeth and you're poisoning the minds of young people for absolutely no reason at all, except your arrogance. I said that in love. Actually, I just love to say it. Here comes the next part. Why was he angry? The Bible tells us the man who put on the feast was angry. Why was he angry? And I want you to listen to this. And it is critical that we understand it. He was angry at what they thought was better than the banquet. There's one name I want to mention. And I care about her. She's an American. She's a legend. But I'm going to tell you, I cannot believe what Oprah thinks is better than Jesus. My mind can't wrap itself around it. What is at the table of the Christian faith? What is seated at the table of the Christian faith? The answer to every human heart issue, every hurt, every problem, Every sin, every fear, every evil was resolved at the cross when Christ died on the cross. How can you think that humanism is better? Every city in America 
where woke is dominating, where the idea that there are multiple genders, the idea that Christ is not really the Son of God, the idea that government and not God ought to rule man's freedom, everywhere that experiment is in progress is a hellhole and a nightmare. You say, Mario, I'm against racism. I'm trying to solve the racial problem. Look at me, Mario, I'm trying to solve the race problem. And you left Christ out? You know what you are? You are a lifeguard that can't swim. You're a surgeon who gasps at the sight of blood. You're a poser. Because all of history screams it out. Every record of every hospital, every college, every institution, every work for the poor, everywhere you look where the poor are fed and people are given justice, the teachings of Christ are there. And not just indirectly, but directly. I'm going to tell you, you may think that humanism is something else, but it is stale hostess Twinkies and ding-dongs. It is cold bean soup. And the Christian gospel is the most delicious and wonderful meal you will ever have in your life. You want women's rights? Not really if you leave Christ out. You want children to be safe? Not really if you leave Christ out. I want to say something about woke that I think needs to be said. And I, I understand the, the, the knee-jerk reaction that many of you are going to have, but I'm going to say it anyway. Amen. If you look at it honestly, the banquet table of woke and the banquet table of Christianity. Woke will not allow itself to be evaluated. It will not permit an opposing viewpoint. Words must be erased even from classic books that have been written. They got to go back and get rid of parts of Hemingway because woke is such a disorder of the mind that if you are open in the least to a narrative that might make woke look untrue or ineffective, ineffective. If anything would arise that would make the idea that your drug use, your philosophy, your dream catcher, your guru, your meditation is in some way or another inferior to the power of Christ, it can't be considered. It can't be open. It must be canceled. It must be erased. Why is that? Now let's go to this table for a moment. There's a moment that identifies the Christian faith in a way that nothing else possibly can in my mind. And it came in a prayer of Christ. When one day he was praying, he said, I pray not that you take them out of the world. I thought to myself, there's a few times I wouldn't have minded an escape. But don't take them out. Don't take them out of the cities. Don't take them out of the institutions. Don't take the Christians out. He said, but keep them from the evil one. Now, I want you to watch. The Christian faith, unlike woke, welcomes your questions, welcomes your doubt. In fact, it insists that you never receive Christ based on emotion or based on guilt or based on fear. Here's what Jesus said. This food is too good to be lied about. I'm going to try this side over here. This meal is too rich that we have to lie about it.
we aren't going to kill you if you draw a picture of Jesus. Because we know that Christ is stronger than any insult, stronger than any debate. We don't need to hide. We don't need to buy the, a, a bomb shelter. We are not a bunker mentality. And the more you persecute the Christian faith, the stronger it gets. The more you lie about it, the truer it gets. The more you insult it, the more truer and stronger it gets. Anybody here? There's a moment in everyone's life that a horrible emotion creeps over them. I've settled for something less than what I could have had. It was Tennyson who said that regret is the cancer of life. You've settled. That's why the man was angry. I can't believe they think this is better than the Christian faith. So one day I received a letter in the mail when I was working as a spiritual leader at the University of California, Berkeley, leading in the Jesus Movement, a student revolution. And I was invited to debate in Wheeler Hall the prime sociology professor of Berkeley. He had written five books the man was noted for his intellect. And he wrote me a letter and said, I want to debate you on Christianity. And I balled up that letter and threw it in the garbage. And in the air, the Holy Spirit said, you're going to go and debate this man. <laughs> now, he had several degrees. I was proud of my high school diploma. And I arrived at Wheeler Hall with 700 students in a journalism school, waiting. And I could hear a voice behind me saying, dead man walking. <laughs> and I had obeyed Luke 21, where it said, don't prepare anything beforehand, because I didn't. I didn't know how to prepare. So he went on and brought up every corrupt pope, brought up every false evangelist, brought up every argument, did everything he could. He, he mentioned Nietzsche. He talked about all of the French infidels. And he went on and on and on, ladies and gentlemen, and then stopped. And when he had hermetically sealed and surgically destroyed the faith, he said, it's your turn. I walked up there terrified, a blank slate. How many of you would like to know what I said? Okay, tomorrow night at 6.30, right here under the... I prayed and I prayed. And when I got up there, I looked at the audience. I said, God, I got nothing. You need to help me. And the Lord gave me a sentence. He said, ask them if they would like to write a best-selling book in the journalism department. Would you like to write a best-selling book? All the hands went up. I thought, that was nice. Now what? The Lord said, ask them if they believe they will. Now, a few hands went up. I said, how many of you believe that you're going to write a best-selling book that'll still be a best-seller 50 years after you're dead? Then I began to tell a story within a story. 
This is when preachers break a basic rule of homiletics, telling a story within a story until they don't look like a preacher anymore. They look like a guy spinning plates. But here's the story within the story. That year, Scientology had bought a great deal of land and built a cavern and taken all of the writings of L. Ron Hubbard and lasered them onto a plate of titanium, put them in capsules, buried them in the earth with reinforced steel. What were they saying? This is the only way we can keep this man's memory alive. Wow. We've got to put it in a space age plastic seal and protect it. I'm saying this to the journalism students. I said, Scientology believes that L. Ron Hubbard's words won't last. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus never wrote a book. But he said someone would. And he said as long as the sun was in the sky and the moon went around the earth, that his word would not leave the mainstream of the world. I'm gonna say it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. I'm not having enough fun yet. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. It is still the number one bestseller in the world. It is still the number one bestseller in the world. I looked at the professor and I said, you did good, sir, but everything you said is irrelevant. You have touched on popes and evangelists and money and corruption and scientific, but you cannot explain the eternal power of the Word of God. And it stands. And after all your books are finished, and after they're out of circulation, and your bestsellers are not remembered, every single syllable of Christ's Word will be in every country, in every nation, in every part of the world. I'm going to try it again, see what happens. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. That is why there is nothing more despicable than a modern Christian preacher who doubts the inerrancy of the Bible. That's why you are a disgusting traitor to us. In fact, it was Matthew Henry said in his commentary of Matthew 24 that one traitor inside of the barracks is worse than a thousand persecutors on the outside. And I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna call you out. You're a pastor, you're a minister, and you told people that the Bible is not the Word of God, shame on you. Shame on you. There, there's not even words for the shame that's on you. Having said all of this, on this important night, the banquet, the banquet belongs to the marginalized, the disenfranchised. This is the Word of God. You have felt like life passed you by. Everybody else got invited to the main events, but not you. And in this story, there's a romance because it's the leftovers, the forsaken, those who are not loved, not in, never have had a shot at what everybody calls success that were first to sit at a table and eat something that the wealthy were deprived of. Now, is that an attack on the wealthy? Not in any way, shape, or form. Because come, some of the poorest people I know have money. And it is a yawning poverty. And this city reeks with it. I'm from California. I grew up in San Francisco. I know what hollow wealth looks like. And it's this madness. 
I can't come to Christ because of this, this thing. So one day, I got on a jet, and I was invited to sit in first class. And since I'd recently discovered Word of Faith, I looked at the flight attendant and said, I receive it. And I sat next to a drunk man. Oh, he was drunk. And he was all lit up. And he started telling me how rich he was. And the Lord said, shut your mouth. Don't say a word. He said, I own a computer company in Silicon Valley. I invented a certain chip. He goes, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I take over an entire huge hotel in Hong Kong and in, in Honolulu and bring in my, my buddies. And we party together. And he went on and on and on. And I'm sitting there. And he's looking at me, and he asked me, what do you do? <laughs> the Lord said, be quiet. I just nodded. <laughs> and he went on and on and on. I said, listen, I can tell that you're not wealthy like I am. You're, you're an upgrade. And I looked at him, and I knew he was drunk. And I've got to tell you, I'm Latin and I'm German. Wow. So the Latino side of me said, kill him. <laughs> and the German side said, what is the matter with you? Control your emotions so you can think of ways to kill him. <laughs> Fortunately, the Holy Spirit won. He said, you want to know what I do? I said, I am a chief spokesman for the richest Jew in the world. Somebody help me right there. That's who I am. And I said, we own planets. We beat Elon into space. His eyes got big. Then he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, I am. Then I got that look, that famous look of someone that thinks their banquet is better than mine. And he kept talking, and God said, keep your mouth shut. He said, let me tell you about me. I have two sons, paid their way through Stanford University. On their graduation day, I bought them each a Ferrari. They jumped in, drove off, I haven't seen them in two years. He said, my wife, that gave me those two boys. We were married 25 years. Then I got rich, and I replaced her with a trophy wife. And he said, let me tell you about my wife. She's sleeping with the tennis pro at our country club. And his eyes started getting wet. And God said, keep your mouth shut. And he said, you know, I can tell you don't have a lot of money. He kept saying that. I'm, bit, I'm busy asking God for a raise. I'm trying to figure out what it was about me. And then he keeps talking, and he keeps talking, and he keeps talking. And he said, you know, I look at you. You don't have what I have. I said, that's the third time you've said that. He said, but you've got something I don't have. You've got something I don't have. I would to God that those of you out in this house would say the same thing. That you would sit in your chair and say, I may have this and I may have that, but I'm telling you, I have never eaten at the banquet at the table of Christ. I don't know what it means to lay in bed and look up at the ceiling and realize that my life is making God smile. I don't have a friend in God. I don't have the power of prayer. I can't open the Bible and see in it 
an infallible owner's manual for every conceivable stress that I would ever go through. I can't pray. I can't read it. I can't believe it. This man, this billionaire is looking at me, crying. And you're not going to believe what he did next. He grabs my hand and puts it on top of his head. And he said, what's wrong with you? You know what you're supposed to do right now? Why aren't you doing it? The child of God carries the presence of God with them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At the end of our story, the master of the house says to his workers, you've asked them to come in. You've pleaded with them to come in, but my house is not yet full. I want you to go out again. And this time, and he used a very special word, compel. Compel. It's an extreme word. And it is interesting to me that one of the most convicting things that could happen to a preacher is to wake up one morning and realize that in his sermons, he has taught, he has persuaded, but he is not compelled, which is the most extreme measure of asking someone to get right with God. In the book of Acts chapter two, it gives you a license for a long altar call. It gives you the right to a long altar call because it says, and with many other words, did Peter say to the crowd, save yourself from this corrupt generation. You know what this generation is doing to you, young lady? You're not thin enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not tatted up enough. At any moment, you could be last year's TikTok reel. This is a world that is cruel. This is a world that chews you up and spits you out. And the man at the banquet said, the food is too good and the need is too great. Go out again. Recently, of all the publications in the world that could have done something despicable, the Rolling Stone magazine, not far from here, by the way, did the ultimate infamy by taking a movie, The Sound of Freedom, and insulting it. This is what woke does. Under no circumstances can our narrative be questioned. And even if we see a movie about children being saved from sexual slavery, we still have to insult it because it goes against the narrative. It may find the kink in our armor. It may find the weakness in our hold on people. Speaking of child abduction, you wake up one morning and there's an Amber Alert on your phone. You see a picture of a little girl. She's been taken. And by some strange and mystical coincidence, you're driving by a park, and there is that little girl at sunset on a swing by herself. Her kidnapper, her enslaver, is not near her. And for a moment, she's free. Now I'm going to ask you what you're going to do. Are you going to get on your phone and say, I just want to report to you that I think maybe I've seen that little girl. Are you going to say, roll down your window and slow down and say, young lady, what you're doing is not safe. You need to go home to your mommy. And I've watched it. I've watched ministers apologize in their altar call. Stand up there and say, well, maybe you're not ready yet. Or if you want Jesus, just kind of bat your eyes at me. 
And I wonder what's happened to you. What kind of moral bankruptcy has taken over you? What you're going to do is you're going to get out of your car. You're going to walk over to that little girl and say, young lady, you're getting in my car. We're going to the police. Tonight, you're going to be back in your own bed with your parents, and you're going to know the sound of freedom. And that's what I'm saying to you. I'm loud, I'm abusive, I'm overbearing. But some of you in this room are going through a living hell because you think that Christianity is weak and your slavery is good. And the Bible says in that day, they will call darkness light and light darkness. You're doing it. You're doing it. That man is abusing you and you're staying with him. That drug is killing you and you can't get away from it. Those thoughts are crashing against your brain and you can't find freedom. And I'm telling you as a man of God, I'm not going to make it easy for you to leave this tent without Christ saving your soul. I'm going to compel you. I'm going to beg you. I'm going to constrain you. You don't understand the love that is waiting for you. You don't understand the arms and the strength of those arms and the hand of God that will come on all your plans. He'll wash away your sin. He'll change your mind. The Bible says that God will give you the two gifts that nothing in woke will ever give you. And it is this, it says in the New Living Translation, in the 12th verse of Philippians 2, it is God who will work in you to give you both the power and the desire to do what pleases Him. The power to get off of drugs and the desire to get off of drugs will combine in you when you say yes to Jesus. All of a sudden, the taste of it will go away. The fear of it will go away. Why wouldn't you taste and see that the Lord is good? Close your eyes right now. It is at this moment that a preacher will look at an audience and say, the choice is yours, heaven or hell. And they don't know that they're only partially correct. Because the choice of heaven and hell, while it's real and true, is not the hell that you'll be in when you die, but the one you're in now. The pain you're in now. The hurt that you're in now. You're not thinking about heaven, you're trying to get through the day. And God is waiting to give you power and life and joy, do you think that anyone in this audience, if you were to respond to Christ right now, if you were to ask Jesus for a new life, and I'm going to tell you who the saddest case in this room is. You're in church. You own a Bible. You believe in God, but you've dabbled with it. And since you never repented, you've never seen the active ingredient launched in your soul. It's been downloaded, but not activated. It's sitting there, unused, no power. The Bible said they have a form of godliness, but deny the power of it. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Now watching what I tell you, you don't have another day to make this decision. This is not a gift you go home and think about. There is nothing left to ruminate, discuss, evaluate, or look at the pros and cons. There's no downside. The only danger is that you would wait and not respond. How can you help me to have a miracle in my life, Mario? How can you help me? I'll help you by asking you to let me pray with you a powerful prayer that will invite Christ to take over your life your choices, your existence. And that prayer 
I want to pray with you because when you and I pray together, we will harness the greatest force in the universe, the power of agreement in prayer. Where Jesus said, if any two of you is agreeing, touching anything, it will be done. The nightmare will be over. The new life will begin. And it starts by swallowing your pride and putting your hand in the air and saying, I want the final answer. I want the true answer. I want the power of that new life. I want to eat at the banquet table of Christ today. My soul is starving, and I need a new life. If that's you, put your hand in the air right now. Do it now. If you think that you're the only one, believe me, you're not. Now I'm going to ask everyone with your hands raised, I want a new life. I want you to pray with me, Mario, right now. Stand to your feet wherever you are right now. Get up on your feet. Stand up. Stand up. There's so much power in this room. There's so much power in this room that I'm going to tell you to have everyone for a moment close your eyes. Those of you who are standing be patient, just stand there for a moment longer. If you are here and you brought someone tonight, you can look at them and you can see the spiritual battle that they're going through right now. And you could tip them in favor of truth and a new life by just humbly leaning over and saying, would you stand for that prayer and let that man of God pray with you if I stand with you? And ask them right now, right where you are, to stand. Get them to stand. You see, and that's working. That's working. That's working. That's working. Anyone else? Maybe no one asked you to stand, but you, this is what's happening to you. All over your heart and mind is the sense that you know you should do this and you don't have the courage. Father, in Jesus' name, break those chains and let them now be set free in Jesus' name. Mara, I know I should have stood up and I didn't. Stand up right now. Wherever you are, stand up. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Over here. There, there are several of you over here. Do it right now. Now, all of you that are standing, find the nearest aisle and walk to the front right now. From wherever you are, get out of your seat and come, come to the front. Start walking right now. We're going to wait for every one of you. You're coming to Christ. You're leaving slavery and fear behind. Right now, if you're still on the valley of decision, get up and join these that are here. Fill in right behind. Let them come. How many of you believe that we should wait for more? Let's wait for more. Let's wait for more. Come in. Fill in right over here. There is someone in this room of tremendous influence. And Satan is screaming in your ear of the persecution you're going to face 
with your visibility in social media if you turn to God. And I'm telling you, it's not worth it. That, that threat is so hollow and so meaningless that you need to not even consider it. You need to come here and join this happy group. You need to be a part of it. Wherever you are. Now. I know they're going to come. Even though there are so many of you that have come to the front, God sees you as an individual, as if you were the only one up here. He's going to give you his undivided attention in giving you the start of a new life. I want you to forget every religious term you've ever heard because your language and your knowledge of the Word of God is going to be so different than what you thought it was because of what Christ is going to mean to you. And before I pray with you, I want you to understand that it is a beautiful thing to repent. It is a beautiful thing to say, I have sinned, and I've hurt you, God, and I've hurt people, and I've lived for myself, and I know I have. And now I'm done with that because all it's done is hurt me and hurt others, and it's left me empty. And I need, I need to become as a child again. I need childlike innocence again. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Now, I knew they were coming. Now, why does the Bible tell us that we need to pray certain words? It's not any kind of a chant. It's not some incantation. It's a heart. It's a heart issue. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 tells us, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Now, I'm going to give you a model for to pray, but you've got to, you've got to say this in faith. And you've got to say it as if it was your own original words. I'm just going to help you. I want you to say, Jesus, Jesus. you are the Son of God. You You came to earth earth. and paid the price price. for my sin. sin. I deserved deserved to be judged, judged. but you you are having mercy on me. And I I repent of all my sin, recognizing that you want to forgive me and you want to cleanse me with the most powerful cleansing agent in the universe, the blood that you shed on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead because that power is what will stop my habits my negative thoughts, my destructive emotions, the evil that tries to control me. You are mighty and nothing is as strong as you are. So you are now in control of my life, my soul. I am a Christian. I am born again. I am set free. And the devil will never have me again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me now. In your mighty name. I'm going to ask the audience to hold your applause. I feel like clapping, shouting, jumping louder than any of you. But I want you to hold it for a moment. 
Point your arm toward these people. The Bible tells us that a man sowed seed. Some fell on hard ground, weeds. Some fell on the wayside. They said weeds choked it. Birds ate it. It was hard, so it didn't take root. But some seed fell on good ground. You're standing here right now, and there might be some around you that are doing this the way they do a lot of problem solving. It's light. It's not sincere. It's not real. But I'm going to challenge you not to be like one of them. I'm going to challenge you to be deadly serious about this decision you've made for Jesus. Deadly. Life and death. This is it. I'm done. Nothing will ever come between me and God. So what we're going to do is direct you to be prayed for by a group of Christian leaders. That they only need about five minutes of your time. And nobody who is here that came with you is going to leave without you or not know where you are. So you relax. You have found the light. You have found the truth. Now take it with all your heart and all your might. And, do, and then follow my instructions. Look at me. You don't know how pretty you look right now. But I'll, uh, hold on one second. You got to save your energy. I want all of you to help me. And I say it all, all the time. We want to recreate the miracle of the Red Sea right here by having some of you get on this side and some of you get on that side. And we're going to pray with you for a few minutes in the back and then you're going to come back in your seat and you will see miracles of healing. You're going to see people that are sick healed. But I don't care if there was a corpse on this stage and it woke up and danced it would not be as great as the miracle God has just given you. You have gotten the miracle. Now, what we're going to do is go down this aisle, all of you on this side, and all of you on this side are going to go down that aisle. And so I want you to turn around and face the audience. And I want you to start walking down the aisle. Those of you there, you need to start the way. It's kind of like, yes, start now. Ladies and gentlemen, jump up and welcome your new brothers and sisters in Christ into the house of God. Come on, love on them. Love on them. Amazing. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are thrilled with what the Lord has done? Hallelujah. While, before you sit down, let me look at you a second. Many of you have come tonight with physical ailments 
many of which medical science cannot help. And you're wondering if you were a fool to come to this tent with the expectation that Christ might heal your body. The answer is that I cannot heal any of you. But, be that as it may, how do you explain the thousands who have been healed in our tent crusades? And the explanation is about to be given to you. How many of you remember at the very beginning of my soul winning sermon that I cautioned the audience that a mystical force was going to work on them and work on their heart and change their direction? For those of you that are seeking healing, you have to hear the same thing. Can't be cynical. You can't stand there and question and oppose the power of the healing virtue of Christ in the modern era. The Holy Spirit wants to come to your side right now and begin to touch you and remove your cancer and remove your illness and set you free. What he will respond to is an honest cry for help. And one thing that activates God, I found, is when someone says, have mercy on me. It got rid of Bartimaeus' blindness. And it is an act of mercy. Don't let anyone tell you to treat God as if he were a new age formula. This is not trust the force, Luke. God is a person who must be loved and admired, revered, and in his presence, we must stay and surrender. So I want you to be seated because I've got a few things to do very quickly that I have to do. I'd like you to look at Acts chapter 8 for a moment. How many of you believe that if we stop the meeting now and go home, we can say this was an astonishing night? But how many of you want more? Raise your hand. How many of you want more? And there's one right there that really wants more. God bless them. Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the words spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man named Simon, called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But, I mean, we like that word. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized, then Simon himself also believed and he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs that were done. Everyone that needs healing in your body, put your hand in the air. This is not a surprise. We see this everywhere. 
a forest of hands. Leave your hand up a moment. I want you to look at me because I'm going to instruct you on receiving your healing in the next few minutes. My sermon for the night is over. This is exhortation and it's short tutorial to prepare you for the power of God. I want you to begin. Say, tonight, tonight. is my night. my night. The Word of God, Word of God. is my promise. my promise. On the cross, On the cross. Jesus, paid Jesus paid for my sin, for my sin. And, my and my sickness. I am dangerous, I am dangerous. When, I'm when I'm healthy. And God knows that I need a miracle. And I believe that under this tent, tonight, I shall be healed. Now shout if you believe that what you said is the truth. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, In the verses that I just read was a nugget, a secret. It uses the word preaching twice, but in the original language, only one of them is important to us right now. The Bible says, they that were scattered went everywhere preaching, but the root of that word is gossiping. It meant that where they went, they were sharing on a personal level and a testimonial that they had been saved. So they are gossiping the gospel. So the other word is proclamation. And Dr. Luke borrowed it deliberately from a military term that was quite prominent at the time. There were many tyrants that used the same proclamation whether it was Caesar Augustus or Alexander the Great. They would sometime lay siege around a city, cut off the water and the food. Then they would wait till desperation set in in the city. And one of the ways that these tyrants stayed in power is that they had minimal blood loss of their soldiers in war. And the people of the nation of, that were controlled by them, whether Rome or the nations under Alexander, saw that their sons would come back alive. It enhanced their power. It galvanized their strength. So every once in a while, they would use emissaries dressed in white robes to walk into the city and read a, a scroll to the city fathers. This city now belongs to Rome, or Alexander, or whoever. And if you surrender, you'll be fed. Your children will be educated. Your lives will be spared. But if you don't surrender, not one of you will be left alive. And that was called a proclamation. A lot different than what we know it to mean. So the Bible said that Philip went down to Samaria and proclaimed Christ to them. And what he was doing, and a preacher should do this. You better listen. I'm not just talking to you, Philip said. I'm talking to every demon in this town. And I'm reading from the Word of God and telling you that you are formally evicted and you must leave you must pack up and get out somebody help me right now anybody here before I said yes to God in tent crusades I did the unimaginable I have a friend here, Ron McIntosh. He's on the front row. He was the reason that I got to meet Oral Roberts. But before I bought my first tent, 
or excuse me, had my first tent bought for me since I have never bought a tent. Every one of them have been given to me and this one was given to us by Kenneth Copeland. Thank you, Kenneth. Now, what are you trying to say? Before I went out in crusade ministry, I began to read about the 50s tent crusades. I looked at all of them. I looked at what they said, what they did, how they operated. And history has been unkind to them. The healing revival of the 50s was infinitely more powerful than any church historian is willing to admit. So many of the Pentecostal churches in the South own their origin to a tent crusade. And I'm going to tell you that whether it was an A. A. Allen, whether it was an Oral Roberts, I read about how they prayed, what they did, and where they went. And I needed to know because I knew I was walking in to danger. How can you stand in front of people and promise them a miracle? And I began to notice something very strange. The audacity that they all had. What was going on with these men? I'm tame. I'm probably the tamest tent evangelist that you'll ever meet. And if you go back and look at these videos of the 50s, you'll go, you're right. These men would punch someone in the stomach that had cancer, pick up somebody that was paralyzed, throw them off the stage. They'd be healed in the air. I remember Oral saying to me how, in, how impressed he was with Catherine Kuhlman because she would call someone out. And she, he said, that was amazing. If I could only have understood that, I would have saved my shoulders. But I, I, t I realized, I said, Brother Roberts, you got it wrong. You sat in a chair in front of 10,000 people with a sick person on crutches, and you're sitting in a chair and every eye on that tent is on you. That's faith. I'm going to try it again. That's faith. Yeah. I read A. Allen's book, The Price of God's Miracle Working Power. And again, he's controversial. But I, I've come to be a kinder person in my old age. And let me tell you something. I finally figured it out. They didn't preach Christ. They proclaimed him. They didn't walk into a town and say, is anybody offended? They told the local authorities, the local devils. They warned every atheist, every Satanist, every person in witchcraft, everybody in Eastern mysticism. They would get up and say, let me tell you, brother, there was a way this church operated and this city operated, but I'm here now and I'm telling you, Christ is in charge. And he's Lord of this city. And I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. Is anybody here? The reason the demons cried out is because Philip did not fall below the order that God gave him. He did not preach under the level of emphaticness and authority that God had assigned him. We have so many people that we can talk about that had tents like this and miracles that were amazing. And that era has returned. It's returned. And the most dangerous thing 
that a minister can do in embarking in a new era because this tent is gonna go across America. This tent is gonna be the holy ground for millions to be touched by the power of God. Not only in the tent, but through this media of live stream. And God is gonna give us miracles. I'm gonna say it again, God is gonna give us miracles. The greatest threat to the new thing are those that are in love with the old thing. And that day when Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah and he was gone in the fiery chariot, his fan base was waiting on the other side of the Jordan for him to come back. And what a moment of anxiety, I thought, how can you say what you're about to say without being self-serving? How can you stand in front of people and say, I believe that the anointing for the miracles we saw in the 1950s that were creative miracles and powerful miracles are going to begin to happen under our tent. For the glory of God. For the glory of God. So he said, where is the God of Elijah? How is that not self-serving? How is that not some sort of self-promotion? To say, you all want the old guy. He's gone. And I'm sorry. See this? I'm holding a mantle right here. And I know who I am. I'm a man, that's all I am. But I didn't come to this town to be one more milk toast, lukewarm, ashamed and apologetic evangelist. I'm gonna stand here right now and say, devil, get out. Devil, get out. Devil, get out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pray in the language of the Holy Spirit, everyone. There's so much power under this tent right now. It's incredible. Don't look at your watch. Don't worry about the time. What happens if in the next five minutes, you see something you've been waiting all your life to see. Pray louder. Pray louder. We are laying a supernatural foundation for this week. All right, the anointing of God's power is flowing in this room. I bind cancer in the name of Jesus. Cancer. I want everyone in this building who is battling cancer to stand on your feet right now. Battling cancer. Stand up right now. I want our workers, our volunteers, I want everyone that is here that came as a volunteer, raise your hand right now, cross it. They're everywhere. I want the volunteer nearest to this person to stand up and lay hands on her. She is scheduled for a radical procedure within the next 30 days. That's true. And you have five separate locations. This thing is metastasized and moved through your body and it's leaving your body right now. In the name of Jesus. 
Workers over here, if you're standing by someone that is standing for a healing of cancer, lay your hand on them right now. Do it everywhere. power of God is flowing. Those with damaged kidneys, the word of the Lord is coming right now. Your kidneys are diseased. Stand up right now, wherever you are. Stand up. I have kidney disease. Obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. you're going to see something you have never witnessed before in your life. Kidneys are being restored. Miracles are happening. Creative miracles. Supernatural, undeniable touch from God. I want my workers to go and find those that are standing with kidney disease and command a miracle. Look out. It's getting stronger. Paralyzed limbs are loosening right now. Paralyzed limbs, spinal cords, backs, legs. It's happening in every corner of this tent. If you need healing in your arms and legs, stand up. Workers, go over there where they are. If God has healed you and you can walk, start walking right now. The power of the anointing is too strong in this room. There's no doubt that God is working. If you are being healed, wave your hand at me. Mara, the healing virtue of Christ is going through my body. Wave your hand at me. Don't just raise it. Wave it at me. There are already dozens who have been healed by the power of God. Heart disease and diabetes. There's an anointing for those two illnesses to be healed by Christ. His power is all over this tent. If you have diabetes, raise your hand, stand up. If you see someone standing, workers, we've got over 1,400 workers. Pray for somebody, find somebody. Sindolo Korea Rekeseso. Glorious power, glorious anointing, glorious power. That spine has straightened, test it. Those legs are free of pain, test them. There's so many healings going on right now, I can't keep up with it all. Now, migraine headaches are being healed by the power of Jesus. Raise your hand, wave it, find someone. Pray for somebody. Oh, there's so much power. There's so much power. Intestinal diseases are being healed right now. Raise your hand. Let someone pray for you. Blindness, put your hand over your eyes and watch as the power of God restores your sight. 
Put your hand over your ear that is deaf. If there's someone you know and they can't hear at all, place your hands on them. Watch as the power of God operates. I proclaim that Jesus is Lord over sickness. I don't apologize. I don't vacillate. I don't doubt. Not for one moment. The power of the Holy Spirit flooding this place. Now it is lungs, respiratory disease. Stand up and receive your healing in Jesus' name. Asthma, chronic bronchitis, residual damage to your scar tissue in your lungs after COVID-19. Healing is coming. Lay hands on them. Healing is coming. Lay hands on them. There are people that are getting up and walking that couldn't walk before. There's pain leaving people's bodies. Paralysis, blindness, sickness, disease. It's all being healed by the power of God. See, I'm up here, but you all are being used of God right now. This anointing is on you. I don't need to leave the stage. The power of God is so strong. Ladies and gentlemen, trust me, the testimonies that are going to come out of this service are going to amaze you. How many of you feel the presence and healing power of Jesus under this tent? You feel it right now. You know it's true. You see, I can't stop this. You know, you're, you can look around and see pockets of people praying for each other, and there is a force of the Spirit that's on their body. There, there, it's fire over here, fire over there. I mean, I could ask for control of this meeting again, but I would have to answer to God. There's too much happening right now. It's too real. We got to let this flow. We prayed too long. How silly would we look that we fasted and prayed for God to take over and disrupt the power of the devil and then have it happen and then we stop it. Get in the river right now, wherever you are. Let the Holy Spirit overwhelm you. So many people are walking that couldn't walk before. So many people are bending with freedom and no pain in their legs. They're breathing. They, they can see. They, they've been set free by the power of Jesus. How many of you believe this fire needs to go across America? Healed. Healed. Healed in the name of Jesus.
I don't know what she threw on the ground, but it's a miracle. Some people are running around the tent. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Spirit of revival, the spirit of awakening, where it isn't about a man or a woman, it's about Jesus. This man left his wheelchair. He's standing up here. They're helping him. But God has touched him, and there's no doubt. I'll tell you, these are the kind of people that were in the Bible that tore the roof off the building and let the man down. They're, Somebody give God more glory, more glory, more praise. Now, the only reason I'm going to have you sit down is I reserve the right to make you stand up again. Because when, a, when an outbreak and a disruption by God happens like this, you don't stop it. But I, but I want you to be seated for a moment, and I want all of you to witness this. I'm waiting. Everybody's almost back in their seat. But let me ask you something. Mario, I was healed by Jesus, and I want to give him the glory for my healing. And I was healed just now under this tent, and I want to give God the glory. Stand up. Who are you? <laughs> Only Jesus gets the glory. But he better get a lot more. Come on, praise him. Praise him. I want, to, I want to make some closing remarks here before we unleash this army on Colorado Springs. I'm going to tell you something. I am not a hero, not a hero of faith or anything else. I'm just a man that obeyed God. That's all I am. If there's anything worthy here, it's him. But, but I want to tell you something. It was hard for you to park here today. It was hard for some of you to get in here. And a whole lot of you got here early. And so we started early. And others may have had a, a very legitimate reason for why they got here at start time. But as you've seen, the Lord has used us to kill Christian Standard Time. We've killed it. You know, and I want to tell you, tomorrow's a work day for many of you. But this is precious. I'm going to look at you for a moment. I want you to look at me, and I want to ask you a question. Is this precious? You see, five years from now, the last thing you're going to remember was how hard it was to park. The last thing you're going to remember is how difficult it was to uh, get your kids to eat and do their homework so you can get to the meeting. The only thing you're going to remember 
is the atmosphere that you feel right now that you know was not induced by a man, but it was done by Christ. And you know, Pastor Mark Coward said something to me very important when he was talking about Father Nash, who was the intercessor with Finney. He said, Mario, it was one before Finney got there. That was this meeting. That was this meeting tonight. This was fasted for, prayed for, and the devil lost before we even sang the first song. So now comes the telling moment. Are we going to waste these four, three nights that are left? I, I just can't imagine that. But the life of it is that this is a river. And the church, unfortunately, is skilled in blocking the flow of a river. The life's blood of this event is you reaching out to people you love and bringing them. You know, I'm going to tell you, you're going to think I'm exaggerating, but I, I'm telling the truth. The Lord said, tonight I want you to preach this gospel sermon and win people to Jesus. Then I want you to pray a mass prayer of healing over the people. But he said the, the miracle service is tomorrow night, not tonight. Because you'll notice I didn't leave the stage. I didn't call anyone out. But it sure seemed like a miracle service to me. I mean, I'm not questioning you, Lord, but it sure did. And if this isn't, and tomorrow night is, what is that all about? But imagine if someone you bring tomorrow night were to be healed the way we saw tonight and last year, where they go to their doctor and they have... Uh, incontrovertible proof of their miracle then we are going to be outside of the swamp of commercialized and prevarication and lying and cheating in ministry we can do this with integrity and be bible based now I need you to reach your friends I need you to understand how important it is now we can get more chairs and I don't know about you, but it's getting pretty nice right now. And you all have had a lot of rain, and God kind of stopped it for this tent meeting. Now, if, if he's going to do that, the least we can do is cancel what we got going and be a part of this. And that, by the way, includes the Fire and Glory Tour that begins tomorrow. And in a moment... I'm going to introduce a very, very dear friend. And uh, he's coming up now, but I've got one more thing to say. My staff gets mad at me because I don't announce my books. So therefore, I have three books. Buy them all. <laughs> Two of them I know you need to get is the new one, It's Our Turn Now. And the second newest book, is do not leave quietly. Now those books are normally $15 a piece. Tonight you can buy both of them as a bundle for $20. But wait, there's more. You know, they say that on TV. I always want to say that in the meeting. I have autographed all those books. So you can buy them and I've signed them. And why? It's a gimmick to get you to buy it. Thank you very much. That's it. I, now. When you put nitro and glycerin together, you get an explosion. Lance and I have done these events separately. We had four and a half thousand people at the World Equestrian Center for a fire and glory with the same precise speakers that are here for this one tomorrow. It's going to be a powerful, powerful, not only are we knocking the devil down, we're kicking him. 
right? So, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that we have put this together. Let's enjoy every moment of this supernatural disruption from heaven of the agenda of woke and the devil in Colorado. I want you to welcome Lance Wall now, right now. Mario Murillo. That man is a national treasure. So here's what you can expect. Tomorrow morning, for three days, we're going to be here. This was originally going to be just evenings, and then Mario called me. He said, I feel like this is going to happen like it's happened in a couple of other places we've been. I think there's an explosion that's going to take place. So when you have supernatural signs, wonders, evangelism, preaching like this, the atmosphere gets set, but there's an accelerator anointing for your own growth. And that's what happens at 10 a.m. tomorrow from 10 to 1. We have just like three hours where, bam, we just go after prophetic teaching and the supernatural. That I think it was the first day in Ocala after we have a 1,000 people. Like, you'll see, it's amazing. Every night, the altar's like that. I don't know where they're coming from. It's like every night. Some nights, I've seen Mario take two altar calls. I'm thinking, where are they coming from? But sure enough, there's thousands of people respond. So what we ended up doing is we pray for them the next day because it's brand new. It's fresh. So it's time to uh, get them filled with the Spirit. We had something like 800 people filled with the Holy Spirit. It was like an upper room on steroids. And when that happens, and you've got fresh believers being filled with the Spirit, it changes the whole atmosphere. So I don't know what exactly is going to happen tomorrow, but I do know that 10 to 1 for three days, three days and three nights, bam, 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 we're doing this on purpose. And uh, it's funny, the thing about Mario's... A ministry that I found interesting. We were out in Sacramento, and he stopped taking offerings. This is unusual. He had a full tent. I said, uh, well, why aren't you uh, taking any offerings for your ministry? I mean, you've got expenses. He said, well, the budget's been met. So in reality, the budget gets met right there at the event. There's no, we don't sell tickets. And like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I got friends of mine that have arena events, and you get VIP seats, and you get ticket sales. Very little, of it. you don't have that here. And you don't have product sales. I'm not going to be talking about any products. But you do have a supernatural moment when you can participate. I want to share with you this. In the Bible, in the life of a New Testament believer, Cornelius, I have an unusual verse that pops up for me here in Acts. It says, this man who wasn't a Christian, he was a seeker after God. He said, four days ago I was fasting he was that hungry for God, he was skipping like breakfast. And by the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and he said to me, this is an angel, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Interesting word, alms. I like to look at these words and break them up. Eleamos une. Eleamos une. What does it mean in Greek? It means your works of compassion that you gave from a heart of compassion. In other words, God looks at your giving and God listens to your prayers. And what makes this interesting, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered. It doesn't say God remembered his prayer. He remembered his heart of giving. The way that he gave, God remembered. So the prayers you're praying and the way that you're giving, you could say, come together in a kind of a merger before God and God releases something to you. And I thought about this. I thought, I believe I've read that in the Old Testament. That's a principle and it's in Psalm 20. The Lord answer you in the day of your trouble. May God defend you and send help from the sanctuary and strengthen you. May he remember all your offerings and accept your sacrifice and grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. The psalmist is saying, may God remember the burnt offering, the sacrifices you've given. In the New Testament, God remembered 
what Cornelius had done. And this was a man who set himself up for a divine appointment, for an angelic visitation, and for Peter to come to his house because he gave with compassion and he, uh, and he prayed with sincerity. Right now, I want to receive an offering for Mario for this tent and for his ministry. He wants to take this to other cities. This is for him. I tell him I'd like to do this for him. But I'm actually asking you to do something now with a heart of mercy for those that are about to be touched in the next meeting and the next meeting and the next meeting so that even in your own life, your prayers can be heard and God can remember and fulfill all the purpose that is in your heart. It's an easy way to give. We have a text ability. You that are watching online, we have many of you are watching. People think they're watching online and we don't know that you're there. You're there and you're even there. God's watching you right now. How you handle an offering, God even sees that. Text MMM to 91999. So you take out your uh, text, your phone, you put in 91999, and you text MMM, it's Mario Marillo Ministries, and a screen will come up so that you can connect with Mario. And if you need an envelope, want an envelope? Some people like, I like to have a point of contact myself. I like checks. I'm old school. I like place, I like it to yeah, put my hands on it, lay hands on it, and put it in an envelope. So I'm kind of like, boom, releasing something. If you want an envelope, put your hand up and we'll get you an envelope. If you're old school like I am, I carry my checks with me. Annabelle carries her checks with her. Keep your hands up. Let's move fast, people. Move fast. May God remember all your offerings. God remembers your offerings. Say this with me. God remembers my offerings. He remembers them. And he hears your prayers. Text 91999. There's more divine appointments God has for you. If you got healed tonight, you're going to build your faith tomorrow. If you uh, got strengthened tonight in seeing things happen, God wants to multiply faith in you so that you do these works. An evangelist is an equipping ministry. Something should be happening with everybody here that makes you go, I could do that. You know, A.A. A. Allen got a miracle ministry. He was watching, um, who was he watching? I think it was T.L. Osborne. And he saw T.L. Osborne, and he was sitting down, and he just looked at him. He said, he's not doing anything. He's not floating around. He's not doing something that I, I could do that. There was like an angel saying to him, you could do that, you could do that. How many of you have a desire to be able to do what Mario's doing and to see God touch people's bodies and see them healed, to be able to have divine appointments on airplanes in weird places? This is the place where you catch it. Father, I thank you. Now, this worship team is so anointed. Let me invite you up and let's close out in an atmosphere of worship and celebration. If you're making out the checks, it's to MMM. If you're texting, it's 9199. And 91999. Text MMM. Hold up your envelopes. Let me pray. Hold up your phones if you're texting. Let me pray. Father, I pray that you'll see everyone here, that you'll hear their prayers, you'll fulfill all of their purpose. And for those that are struggling with what to give and how to give, I pray you cause all grace to abound so they have abundance in their life to do with generosity all that they want to do. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank the pastors that are here tonight. I thank my friend Andrew Womack for being here tonight. So beautiful that he came down. One of the things that God's doing is he's bringing the body of Christ together for a great end time harvest and he's putting his own, his own ministry teams together. You'll be surprised at the people that God's going to join together. We'll have Lou Engel here this week. He'll be here. We're going to have a lot. We're going to have a lot of people joining the great army. Locking shields. Sister, take us into that beautiful place. Would you all stand up? 
Come on, just as we end, let's just go ahead and sing this out again. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. You want to pass the, put your offering, pass the offering uh, buckets. Let's wait till the offerings have come through. I love seeing all the youth, the zeal of the young worshipers. And I bless you in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. See you tomorrow at 10 a.m. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. We haven't seen what you can do. There is power. Much power in your name. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe.